So today we got Grant Cardone. Grant Cardone is the New York Times bestselling author of a few books, including but not limited to 10X. And he is also with his Cardone Capital company managing over a billion dollars in real estate. And I was just telling Grant before we begun, you know, one of the things that really changed my life was I stumbled across this brash individual's YouTube video one time. And I said, who's this guy? And I was busy making probably about 40K, 38, 42K a year. And this guy said in the interview, your problem is not that you're not saving enough. Your problem is you don't have enough income. And you said, forget about everything. Forget about trying to invest your little stipend of $100. Stop trying to do all these things and focus on getting your income up. And I went head over heels into that. And it only took about 12 months to have a uh, multi-million dollar business. And, and all these things were already right in front of my face, but it was as if I was just focusing on so much constriction. Things hadn't really changed. My videos started going viral. My books started taking off and, and my life really changed. So I, I do want to thank you for that. Yeah, you got it, my friend. You, you just can't, it's impossible to save your way to prosperity. And that's one of your most popular videos is when you sit down and makes a lot of people mad. You sit down with the whiteboard and you're, I think it's a Peter Thiel. And he is essentially saying, if you have less than a million dollars, you can't even protect your family. And you break down basically how worthless anything really other than multiple millions of dollars is. And you do the math on it. And, and I think that is just a huge eye opener for people. Would you say now more than ever with everything going on in the world that that whiteboard illustration you made is a really accurate assessment of what's, of you know, look, people are being told by the government, uh, by teachers, parents to, to think with what they think is reasonable. But if you just do the math, and you mentioned a book earlier, The Millionaire Next Door book, which I read that book, and that book influenced greatly my thinking today because by the time I got three, three fourths through that book, I'm like, this describes how I was raised. Save money, buy used, uh, buy low, sell high, hold for the long term, the, these ideas. I'm like, this, this is what makes people old. This is, what, this, is, this is why so many old people take cruises. Because they they finally now have enough money to go on a cruise. Uh, unfortunately, uh, they're they're stuck with you know eighteen hundred other people on a boat um, because the deal the deal looks so good. I get to go see Great Greece for you know a little bit of money, uh, but you know if you wanted to do that on your own boat, uh, it would take more than a little bit of money in retirement. <laughs> but that would be the way to do it. So, so why did we get to thinking that I had to be one of 800 people or 1,800 people on a, a ship rather than say, oh, I want to go on my own sailboat with my family. And I'm not opposed to meeting new people, but I don't want to be stuck on a ship for eight, uh, with 1,800 people. The, the thinking's just different, right? So the millionaire next door basically says, look, the way, the way to have a million dollars is to save money. And, and what I'm saying is, no, the way to get a million dollars is you could save money and, and get old, meaning it's going to take a long time. Or you could say, hey, I'm going to go get a million dollars and here's, you know, a hundred different ways to get a million dollars. And I'm, I'm going to figure out the way that gets that money in the shortest period of time and then do it a second time and a third time and a fourth time and a fifth time. And if you are one of those people that says uh, money, that's, that's not my driving force. I want to help people. Well, go do what I just said and then give all the money away. Because now at least you have a, a money to give away. You, you, whether you go to Starbucks or not and spend four bucks is not going to determine the financial outcome of your life when you're 60 years old. What you do today uh, after you leave Starbucks and waste four bucks, which I agree it's a waste of money. What you do today, uh, whether you buy a new car or used car, look, you, you, you know, whether you do those things or not, what's going to determine whether you have zero financial drama no financial stress and financial freedom becomes your battle cry is what you produce, not what you say. And that's such an important distinction because we're actually taught not to produce actually. And so now you're looking around and the thing that really you, 
my wife's pregnant right now. We're due with our first baby in July. And you look at the Federal Reserve policies and you look how much money they're printing. And you, you look at the, obviously the, the negative consequences of infinite money printing. And you see, even if they're able to cement this over and, and eventually there's some relative new normalcy, everything is going to be significantly more expensive when the dust settles. And that's the thing that I think everyone needs to start to grasp is one, your government can't take care of you because they actually don't have any money of their own. They print and then they tax us in order to pay for the printing, to finance the printing. And we need to start to build additional income, become producers. And I feel like those are the only people that are really going to be able to survive in the future. Do you think that that's an accurate assessment? Yeah, this is why the wealthy get wealthier. It's not because of, of um, politics, even though I'm sure politics contribute to that. It's because the wealthy make different moves than poor people do. And, and when I say poor people, I'm, I'm talking about the middle class. Uh, my daughter, my daughter one day came up to me and said, she was seven years old. And she says, so Papa, the middle class, middle class is basically rich people that are actually poor. And I said, yeah, that's exactly what it is. They got two bikes, a BMW and a Lexus and the house. They got, you know, they owe 200 grand on their house and the house is worth uh, whatever, 300 or 400. They can't leave the house. So it's not really an asset because you shouldn't even count a house as a, a financial asset because you have to live there anyway. It's not like you're going to get rid of it and go live on the streets. So you're trapped. Okay. Financial freedom is about not being trapped, not being fixed, go where you want, do what you want, as long as you want with who you want to be able to say no to some people. Like, I don't want to do business with you. Uh, I don't want to sell. I had a guy call me yesterday and said, Hey man, I can get you 50 million N95 mask and you can make, you can make $25 million. I'm like, dude, I, I don't want to have to sell mask. Like how can we give them to, to people that need them? You know, and, and that'd be a cool thing to do, right? But the, the, the point is, the wealthy play offense. They don't play defense. When they're creating wealth, look at Elon, Elon Musk. When he sold PayPal, literally the week after he sold PayPal, he took all the proceeds and bought, invested the entire amount. Not some of it, not half of it. He didn't spread it out in ETFs. He didn't go invest in a bunch of mutual funds so he could protect his wealth. He took the entire chunk, invest. He didn't go buy a house. He took the entire thing and divided it into three major investments that he was willing to lose everything on. That's how you create wealth. And that is terrifying for the, for, for the middle class because we have been brainwashed to diver, diversify our investments. That benefits Wall Street. To invest in the stock market, that, in, that, that benefits Wall Street. To buy a home that fixes us in one location, that benefits the entire system. To get married, if you get married, then you get a tax benefit. Uh, to hunker down, settle down, get a good college education, that benefited Yale and Harvard and MIT, uh, which, by the way, are connected to the banks. Uh, those guys, they lend, they lend so much money to the, to the, to, to multi apartment owners like I am because they want income flow. They want flows of income, multiple flows of income to one, protect their wealth, but most importantly, to grow their wealth. And that's the name of the game, man. You got to grow wealth. And a lot of people don't want to do that. A lot of people, particularly people that live in San Diego, you live there because it's beautiful, blue skies, great surf. Uh, the weather's uh, awesome all the time, but it's almost impossible to live there and have any financial freedom. I agree. And that's why I told you before, we're moving to Washington state, save me an extra 13%. So, all right, you know, I'm 28 and obviously you've got a lot of people around my age that, that are on your staff as well. And obviously they're at the top 1% of our generation, but I look around at a lot of my peers. And like you said, whether it's San Diego or Los Angeles, they're spending 60, 70% of their money on rent alone. And so there's no money left over. And I think all of this happening right now and seeing these federal reserve policies and, and, and 
through their proxies now starting to just, they're going to start buying up the S&P through their proxies even. And you're yeah. just going to see this crazy shit happening. And I guess. But I, look, I, look, just take that off the table, okay. right? Take it off the table. It just look at what it was like three weeks ago before this 10 trillion, there's $10 trillion getting ready to be printed. Like you were talking about, but take the 10 trillion off. Even before that event, you had people paying 50% in LA, 50% of their income goes to uh, rent. Now, why would somebody stay in LA and put up with that bullshit? Oh, I like it here. It's so nice here. Uh, my career is here. I'm an artist. I have to live here. No, you don't quit lying to yourself. You know, but see, financial freedom is not a, it is not a priority for those people. They have been misinformed about the importance of money. How easy it is for us to find somebody that says, oh, money's not going to make me happy. I'm not driven by money. Y you need money. Okay. Like if you want to live on this planet, if you want to write, if you want to do a movie in LA, you need money. These movies aren't being done with no money. So, so you, you have to have money and anybody that's denying it is basically quit on the money game and you can't really play on this planet as long as we're trading with dollars, which is st still more effective than trading donkeys for <laughs> goats and goats for chickens and chickens for uh, dresses. You, you, you need a currency that you can pass back and forth, right? And that currency with or without inflation. Your freedom is dependent upon one thing. How much income can the individual bring in? That first determines how much you can spend. Uh, these ball players that we see that go broke, okay? We think they had spending issues. The truth is, if you look, look at it, they didn't have a spending issue. They had an income issue. Their career ended. They quit getting endorsements. They quit getting fights. They couldn't get another gig. Nobody would pay them enough money. The big purses stopped and then they continue to spend even though the income stopped. You can spend or give away whatever you want as long as you have enough income. So right now I feel like what's happening is people are, they're kind of getting hit hitting in the face. And I feel like a lot of people, I hope, are going to wake up from this. And I guess going back to talking about playing offense and understanding that whatever you used to make 60 K a year, you're going to have to make double that to maintain the same lifestyle 10 years from now. How do we play better offense? And what are steps that your average person that, you know, they're not making your average person, what the average household makes 60 K a year or something. And it's, they say that the app, that incomes went down by 25%. If you've kept your job right now, uh, how yeah. do you play better offense? Like what are the steps you start with to say, shit, now let's see if I can just start to make an extra one grand. Then I'm going to turn it into 10 grand. Like, how do I, how do you get there? What do you do? First, you got, you got to get rid of the false information you have about money. Like this is not, this is not your mommy and daddy's economy where your mommy and daddy used to be able to save money. And first of all, they could save money and earn interest at the bank. That's gone. That's over in your lifetime. You will never see, you will never earn any real money. Again, save your money, save your money. Who'd that benefit? The banks. Go to college, go to college, go to college. Who'd that benefit? That benefited the government because the government didn't have to count you in the, in the employment numbers. Really important to be reelected uh, because if you're going to college, you're not part of those numbers. And number two, you borrowed money from the government in order to go to college. College has benefited. That's the most inflation product in the country has been colleges. So, so again, prison, man, we're making prisoners. So the thing to do is to like, wait a minute, I need money. I need income. We're, we, we tell people to follow their passion. Follow the money. You will become passionate. Okay. Bill Gates is going to get to do whatever the hell he wants to on this planet with his passions, whatever that is, good or bad. Uh, he will be able to do whatever he wants now that he followed the money. And when he was building Microsoft, when Steve Jobs was building Apple, they were following money trails. When Elon, uh, when, when uh, Jeff Bezos built Amazon, he was following traffic. Uh, this famous story about, hey, I watched, uh, I watched the search on the internet, what, 25 years ago for books going up 12,000% a day or something. He was working for a hedge fund. He didn't follow his passion. He followed the traffic. 
He followed trends. He followed the, he, he looked at where, where are eyeballs going? Wherever eyeballs go is where money goes. And it makes him the richest person in the world. So <clears throat> the thing, the thing people have to do, number one is make a decision. I cannot live on 60 grand a year or 80 grand a year or 140 a year. I need to be above that number in order to have any kind of cushion. Okay. Number two, first, you got to make the decision. You not got to make that a priority. Say, Hey, I'm going to go, I'm going to go find out what, how do I make 140 rather than 70? How can I do it? Don't, don't debate about whether you should or should just ask yourself a better question. How could I, I'm a plumber. How could I go from 70 to 140? What would I have to do to make that happen? Okay. And then, and then, what do you want to do? Why are you doing it? Right? Like, like, why do I want financial freedom? Cause I don't, I don't personally want to be tugged around, uh, in fear and drama with my family, my two little girls. I don't want to be my wife, my, my, my friends. I don't want to be in drama every single day. I don't, I don't need a lot of stuff. I don't need $400 shoes, but I do want financial stress out of my life. So for number one, make a decision. Number two, how can I do it? And number three, go pursue that as though you're passionate about it because it will provide you with the most important thing in the world, which is freedom. So if you were a plumber, let's talk about that specific example. Let's say you actually made 70 K a year. That was real life shit. And you were like, I need to make more money. If you were staying as a plumber, I have a couple ideas, but what would you do if you're like, I make 70 and my first goal is I want to get up to a hundred. What would so you would, do if you were self-employed, no one on your step, it was just you, what would you do? I, I would look at how I made the 70. Okay. What's the best part of that 70? What was the easiest part of the 70? And what part of that 70 can I scale? There might be part of that 70 grand that I took in that I really don't want that money anymore. I might have to give something up. Okay. The plumber might find out that there's more money actually in getting the job than doing the job. He probably will find that out in fact. So if I'm self-employed, look, I did, this is what I did. I was making three grand a month and I'm like, I got to get to four grand a month. It was 1000 bucks at a time. I literally went from making three grand a month to four grand a month. Once I made that first fourth, of, I was trapped at three grand a month. I could not make more than three grand, whatever. My, 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 I mean, I don't even know what was happening to me. It was like, I was, I had a damn uh, dome on me <laughs> and I could not. And then I changed my mind. Next thing I know, the first month I made 4,000 bucks. I said, that was the most important thousand dollars I ever made in my entire life. That was actually the most important money I ever made in my whole life. Because now I was like, oh, wow, I can actually make, earn, get more money. And then I just started looking at, okay, now I went to four. How do I go to five? How do I go to, from five to, to 7,500? How do I go from 7,500 a month to 10,000 a month? And you just got to do the math. You will always come up with this though. If you're doing math, not don't be emotional, be analytical. How many people do I need to see? How many people do I need to call on? You're always going to come up with this one answer. Who has my money? I got this little sticker. It's like, I got one right out here, actually. Let me see. On, we got, I don't know, uh, 150 desks in here that are unmanned right now. because I know. I can see them all back there. Room. We're all, we're all in quarantine right now, but right. Here, here's one that just came off. Who's got my money? And this is something that I started doing when I was 25 years old. Who's got my tennis shoes? Who's got my rent? Who's got my car payment? Uh, who's got my hat? Who's got, who's got whatever I, who's got my advertising, my branding. I don't pay for anything ever. I haven't paid for anything in 37 years. I get somebody else. I go out to the marketplace. I get some money. I take that money and I invest it and then I'm broke again. And then I go out and get money again. And it might sound carnivorous. It might sound selfish and, and, and like, I'm always worried about my money. I'm always broke. If you're broke, you worry about money. I mean, if you understand that you don't have any money, the thing you're going to do right now, if you're actually sane is you're going to go get money. You're not going to blame. You're not going to protest and you're definitely not going to go buy toilet paper. <laughs> if you're truly broke. If you're truly broke, you will wipe your ass with your hand. <laughs> you will not go to the store. You'll go to the phone station and use somebody's toilet, right? You'll, you'll, you'll jump into the McDonald's, go in there, not buy anything and use their toilet. You're not going to go buy toilet paper. Like, 
the, the millions of people did in the last three weeks. It's, it's, it's an incorrect priority. People priorities are screwed up and you're not going to go smoke, grab some weed. You're not going to go to the club. If you understand you're broken, you want to fix that. You're going to do one thing. You're going to go, who's got my money. So I think like we did when we were in high school, man, who can give me a lift? (laughs) Anytime you wanted something in high school, you didn't have any money. You're broke. You ask somebody for help. Who can give me a lift home? You know, who can give me a connect with blah, blah. Okay. Which girl will go out with me? Who has, there's a person. The point I want to make here is if the plumber wants to go from 70 to 140 and then 140 to 1.4 million, who can help you do that. So when I was making about 40 and I listened to you talk about expansion, I did a couple things. And and first of all, the first thing I did is I realized I literally was broke. And I think that's most people's problem. They actually don't understand that they actually are broke. You know, like today, just for my wife and I, I'm spending 1600 bucks a month just on freaking health insurance. And it's going to go up after this too. Yeah. And so right. first was that. And then second, you know, you hit it on the head. You said to really take inventory of where the money's coming in and see what's good and bad. And what I ended up doing is I realized I was in two businesses. One was get some money right now. And two is where do I want to go? And I applied basically the 80, 20 rule. And I realized I needed to shave off a good portion of where my money was coming from and shift. And then I didn't have the money to hire anyone. So I brought people on, on a, on a profit share basis, which was great for both sides because then he had responsibility in the game too. And it aided us quite well. And I think that's an important thing is to take inventory of it like that. Yeah, yeah, I learned that. I went to a treatment center for drug addiction when I was 25. They taught me about it, doing inventories, you know, and, and I did an inventory on my life, right? And that's what I do today. I do inventories on my assets and my liabilities. I don't want cash. Cash makes people weak. Cash is a liability. You worry about it. You take it, you put it in your wallet, your house, you're worried about it all the time. Put it in your mattress, you're worried about it. Put it at the bank, you're worried about it. Put it in the stock market, you're worried about it. I don't want cash. I don't want to be liquid. If I keep it in my front pocket, keep it in my desk drawer, keep it in my house, I'm worried about it. who's going to take it, who's going to rip it off, am I going to lose it? Um, cash is a liability. Okay, so what I do is I take cash and I go buy properties that produce cash. Now, in the case of the coronavirus, we have real estate becomes a bit of a liability for just a moment. If you over leveraged it, if you didn't manage it properly, if you didn't take care of the tenants, et cetera, it comes to liability. All assets can become liabilities at some point, you know, getting great as a plumber, the plumber that makes a hundred grand because of his, because he knows how to flip a wrench because he's great at it. That becomes at some point becomes a liability because for him to become more than just a plumber, he will have to give up his skill as a plumber and become a businessman or businesswoman plumber. And, and so see what I do is I just, I get rid of the idea that I have something actually is an illusion that my house is an asset or cash is an asset, you know, uh, uh, or even my health is an asset. I got my health today, but that doesn't mean to be protected. The best way for me to protect cash is to take the cash, convert it to a property where I can't get it, can't touch it. I don't want to be liquid. The banks want you liquid, man. Wall Street wants you liquid because as long as you're liquid, you can blow it. See, I, they can't get my money because it's sitting in assets that are fixed and that produce income. The only way to get it from me is to wait for the income to come out of the properties. That leaves me when every week ends, every month ends, every year ends, it leaves me without money. And I got to go back out and ask the question, who's got my money? Okay. Because, because having money is an illusion that, 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 that's why rich people go broke. Okay. Because they, ha- they, they, they go out and buy watches and cars and junk that, that, that create an illusion that they're rich, but they are only rich temporarily. What you want is you want wealth that can't be destroyed. Okay, so I'm starting to realize that and, you know, my business is, has done, you know, relatively okay, you know, pulled in at a couple million and, and I wasn't smart enough because I was just focused on, on scaling 
and I got freaking blindsided by my by my taxes. And yeah. I paid more in taxes than I made just yeah. 24 months ago. And so I realized, wow, there's a whole nother level. And I, I, as like a, you know, a million dollar earner is I'm paying the bulk of the taxes. Um, yeah, that upper middle class. And I realized I really messed up. And so how does, how do I go? How does one go to that next level, understand taxes, start to get to a more indestructible yeah. level of cash flow. So look, now you got to learn the money game, right? You now you've made some money, you put it away. You got to learn the, the the wealthy money game, which is how do I use? How do I like the, the, Trump just passed a, in the stimulus code? He pla- passed a rule that that would allow you, if you were willing to lose money this year, if you were willing to take the two million or whatever you got right now, invest it in order to buy losses, you could actually go back and recapture the the tax uh, the taxes you paid for the last five years. In your case, it's going to be probably the last year, year and a half, and you could recapture that. You got it. If you want to create wealth, you have to learn the tax game. Taxes are the biggest single expense to an individual. It's not their home. 50% of your wealth is destroyed by the IRS. So, that leaves you with 50% to live on. That's why I left California. I left uh, eight years ago. So that saved me 13%. So now my tax base goes from 50 to, let's say, 37. Okay, now I want to take the 37 to zero, if at all possible. If I, if I could take the 37% and make it negative, I would do that too. So how do I, how does one do that? You know, this isn't especially taxes. I think the average person maybe is starting to understand a bit more about the entrepreneurial side. Then you say, well, you need to understand the tax game. Uh, yeah. What is there for us to know about the tax game or, or the next well, generation? Well, you just gotta, you gotta, you gotta, again, you gotta make a commitment like to typing. How, how do I, how do I learn about how, how to type? You know, I got to type. How do I learn English? I got to, I got to go to class. Uh, how do I learn about taxes? Same thing. How do I learn how to write code? How do I learn anything? You, you, you know, I, I have a commitment to, to reduce my taxes as low as my, my personal income taxes as low as possible. I already contribute. I pay plenty of taxes. If I pay no income tax, my property taxes by themselves were last year was $40 million. So I'm doing my part. No, nobody can tell me I'm not doing my part. Every time I buy something, every time I hire some, hire someone, you know, 500 plus employees, we pay them all payroll tax, employee tax, matching. Uh, I'm doing my part. So my job though, as a wealth seeker, freedom seeker is to reduce my tax bill. Once you make the commitment, then you start saying, okay, what's in that new stimulus package? The president that we have is a real estate guy. Number one, you got to think that, man, real estate might be where I want to invest money right now. Real estate is the greatest tax protector in the world. And so, number two, Donald Trump has been his restructured loans more than once. So you got to start thinking about how, how does this guy, what code will he and the Kushners write and get passed by the Congress that are beneficial to those people that aren't lazy, that are committed to wealth creation, and that are willing not to blame, but take responsibility for, okay, how do I play this game where I win? Like any game. You play any game with me, gin, backgammon, um, monopoly. Dude, what, what do I got to do to win the game? Same thing with the wealth game. And most people aren't playing it to win. They're being used as pieces. And shame on you, shame on you or anyone that knows that intellectually and then allows it to go on. And I appreciate what you're doing. You're helping a lot of people, Jake, with, with what, you're, what you're doing and how you're making changes and, and, and doing things like this is awesome. Thanks, Grant. I appreciate it. So... Real, what do you? What is your thoughts on the real estate market right now? Do you think we're going to see a big price correction or or a price crash as people are unable to make loans, or do you think that them doing these types of stimulus things on mortgage forbearance is going to hold it up long enough? What do you foresee out of the economy? I, I, I think what you're going to see now is that housing is going to get slaughtered. Uh, duplexes, fourplexes, eightplexes. Government subsidized housing, affordable uh, housing uh, that is government subsidized is going to get pummeled. 
Uh, anybody that took out high leverage loans that are over leveraged on any of their deals, they're going to lose their properties. Uh, then there's going to be a group of people that buy high quality assets in great locations where there's positive job migration, cash flow. They maintain their properties. They're going to make they're going to make so much money. It's going to be unbelievable. America will become a renter nation now. It will finally surrender to owning homes, office office uh, uh, office style um, real estate will get hurt. Strip centers will get hurt. Retail centers. Big retail complexes will probably get hurt forever. Um, industrial will do well. Storage will do well. And multifamily, 250, 300 unit complexes in good, good locations, not all of them, in good locations that are well amenitized. Affordable rents, $1,200 to, to $2,000 a month are going to be fine. And when do you see that? Do you think we're going to see a price correction in, in multifamily in, in, in the coming times over the rest of the year? I don't like the kind of stuff that I buy. I don't think you're ever going to see that because it provides income, more income than you can get from bonds, more income than you can get from dividends, more income than you can get from the banks. These are, these are, I think apartments, regardless of all the bad news you're seeing. Uh, fortunately, I've been right for, for a, lot, a little while here about things to avoid and things to lean into. Um, I believe apartments are going to benefit as going to be one of the great beneficiaries this cycle, just like they were in 2008. If inflation comes, uh, my, my one and a half billion dollars worth of real estate, who knows where it goes? Dude, when inflation comes, you want property. Hope you enjoyed this interview with Grant Cardone. We had a little internet problem and it cut out it as we were wrapping up, but I want to summarize it here into a few important things. And number one is to realize that money isn't what it used to be. You're going to need more than you think that you need. And if you're someone that says, well, money's not that important, think about other people. Think about your children. Think about the people you can support. And then just think about the fact of what the Federal Reserve and government policies are doing to the money. So even if your income stayed the same, your purchasing power over the next 10 years is going to significantly drop. So then it all comes back to, as Grant says, who has my money? Or more specifically, how can I start to make an extra $1,000? Pull out a pen and pad and write out every idea you can come with. Take inventory of where all your money comes in from and say, can I take this part right here? Do you think I could increase this part by 20%? What strategic things can you come up with? I didn't have any money to fund a bunch of employees and people to help me. And so I brought on partners and I gave them equity share in a business that wasn't really producing money. And that turned into an incredible long-term opportunity for myself, for my partner. And that was what I needed to do in order to get to the next level. So pull out a pen and pad, write out your ideas, start focusing on the things that might be the highest income producing ones. And it all comes back to a central theme that we talk about here on the channel, which is you have to increase your income ceiling. As your income ceiling continues to rise, that's when you start to get more freedom. So if you enjoyed this video, either on this side or this side, make sure you hit the like button and leave a comment down below. Who's got my money? Comment down below, who's got my money? And make sure you hit the subscribe and bell notification to support the channel. Talk to you soon.